have the honour to head up the Canadian Centre for Ethics in Public Affairs, which is a joint initiative of the Atlantic School of Theology and St. Mary's University. And we're very pleased, as we often do, to partner with, uh, with another organisation to bring this session to you today. And we're partnering on this occasion with the Atlantic Metropolis Centre and its director, Dr. Medina van der Plaat, has been working together with us to, uh, to, to put the program together. For our discussion today on ethics in migration, reflecting our national vision through immigration policy, with our keynote speaker, Tom Denton, who we're absolutely delighted to, to welcome, and Tom will be introduced more formally in a few moments. Our mission at SACEPA is to provide an arena for critical thinking, discussion, and research into current ethical challenges in society. And we do this by sponsoring public presentations like today's event, supporting research. So those of you who are here from the academic community, I refer you to our website where we have a call for proposals for research fellowships. We assist organizations who want to integrate values and ethics into their governance, their planning, and their operations. And each year we deliver a series of public lectures where people like yourselves can come to engage on the, the topic of the day, topics always of public importance. As I said, we never like to do this on our own. We like to partner with organizations where we find mutual interest. And we're very pleased in bringing you today's program that the Atlantic Metropolis Center, which is the Atlantic node of Metropolis, has joined with us to do this. Metropolis is an international network for comparative research and public policy development on migration, diversity, and immigrant integration in cities in Canada and around the world. So having dealt with the, the housekeeping matters and given you an introduction to both SACEPA and Metropolis, I'm now going to hand the floor over to Dr. Terry Murphy, Vice President Academic at St. Mary's University, a member of the board of the Canadian Centre for Ethics in Public Affairs and chair of the board of Metropolis Atlantic. As you see, Terry is a busy man with all these responsibilities and many more, and I'm delighted to invite Terry to the podium to introduce our special speaker today. Terry. Thank you, Sheila, and I'm very pleased to join you in welcoming everybody to this event. All the more pleased because it is a partnership event between two centers, uh, which are very dear to my heart and with which I've been involved, as you pointed out, for some time. In fact, in both cases from their inception. And I'm delighted to be welcoming our distinguished speaker, Tom Denton, who, as many of you know, is a nationally and internationally recognized writer, speaker, and consultant on immigration policy. From 1984 until 2000, Tom served as the executive director of the International Center of Winnipeg, a center which uh, provided settlement and integration services to immigrants. But he has had, in fact, a very varied career. Uh, too varied for me to enumerate in detail, but his work as the executive director of the International Center followed 25 years in the business sector where his accomplishments include being the founding publisher of the Winnipeg Sun newspaper. He is a native of Nova Scotia, and it's uh, very nice to know that not only is Tom with us today, but so is his wife June and his sister Carol. And Tom was born in Amherst, but raised in Halifax, and we claim, as, claim him as a Haligonian, which he's happy to be uh, described as. And I might add that his 102-year-old mother still lives here as well. I wouldn't have been surprised if she showed up today. Huh? <laughs> Tom has a Bachelor of Arts degree from Acadia and a law degree from Dalhousie. He's been an active participant nationally and internationally in many things, including the Metropolis Project, where he's often a speaker at conferences and symposia. He's also been active for many years with the Canadian Council for Refugees. And I want to mention especially that in 2005, 
on behalf of a national working group, he wrote a, a, a toolbox, a very valuable toolbox called Attracting and Retaining Immigrants, a toolbox of ideas for smaller centers. And that toolbox was launched here at Pier 21. Migration and ethics has been a prominent theme in Tom's speeches and writings. And as I say, we're very, very pleased that he can be with us today to discuss this extremely important topic. So please welcome Tom Den. Well, it's, it's, I'm just delighted to be here. Uh, it's always nice to come home. And uh, there are a number of people in the audience that I know well, so it's nice to be here for that reason and to see them again also. I, I feel connected. I was quite pleased about the auspices of this organization because although I've been involved with, with Metropolis in the, its Canadian form since day one, um, I go back a lot further in a, in a way with the, uh, uh, the, the other auspices here coming out of because I, when I was at Dalhousie, I lived at Pine Hill Divinity Hall. And I have fond memories of that place. I would sure like to go back and have a visit and see what it's become. You know, that wouldn't be, I'd like to, I'd like to have a look. Maybe I can, I don't know, do, do, they, do they still live there? Do students still live there? Oh, maybe I'll see my old room. <laughs> when I was, uh, Visiting my mother yesterday, the last thing she said to me as I was leaving was, don't forget your speech. <laughs> now there's a story behind that. <laughs> because although I've attended conferences in this hotel before, I don't recall performing here before except once. When I was something like 12 or 14. And the, there was an institution called the Manitoba, not the Man, Maritime, the Maritime Academy of Music. And I took piano lessons. And they had their recitals upstairs in the ballroom. And so on this particular night, I came out on the stage, sat down at the grand piano, and I had a pretty accomplished piece in my head and I started to play and I forgot it. It went right out of my head, right out of my head. It was the most embarrassing, painful moment of my entire life. <laughs> so I wasn't taking any chances today. <laughs> and I have my speech with me. Though the ethics in migration reflecting our national vision through immigration policy. This is, this is a really large topic. Uh, I don't plan to do anything more than sketch it in today because it is a large topic. Um, I think that it could be a book or it could certainly be a full semester course at the university level. So, uh, but I'm hoping that my, my remarks won't be overly long, and I'm hoping that we can have some kind of a conversation around some of these points um, at the end. Where were you when your boy Sidney Crosby scored that goal? The odds are that you, like 80% of Canadians, were watching the final match for the Olympic gold medal. I was in a small packed bar in a Toronto hotel, mostly amongst strangers. We all cheered, stood, and sang O Canada. It was a great moment, and I confess that a tear or two ran down my cheeks. Some commentators afterward wrote that across the country, it was Canada's most emotional outpouring of national pride since VE Day. Where were you on VE Day? The odds are that most of you weren't even born. I was right here in Halifax, a witness to the riot that smashed 
much of the downtown. I saw the slopes of Citadel Hill covered with people drinking stolen Olin's beer in the sunshine. The broken store windows along Barrington Street and the looting. I stood on the steps of St. Mary's Basilica looking across Spring Garden Road at that ancient cemetery where a large flat-topped tombstone had become a well-stocked bar of stolen liquor. I was only a kid where I shouldn't have been, but I remember the fear in the general populace. You might imagine that I have trouble with the analogy to the Crosby goal. I was pleased the other day to read of the official apology by the Nova Scotia government uh, to Viola Desmond. I remember the racism here in 1946. That was the era when the great Louis Armstrong, Satchmo, and his band played Halifax, but were unable to stay at this hotel because it had a policy that excluded blacks. At that time, the hotel was owned by the, by the uh, uh, Canadian National Railway, which was in turn owned by the Canadian government. They stayed at the Carlton instead. Thankfully, times have changed. These events of the post-war era are useful bookends for what I want to say this afternoon. I could use other bookends too, like the refusal in 1939 by Prime Minister Mackenzie King to allow the MS St. Louis to land at the port of Halifax, its cargo of Jews fleeing Nazi Europe. When the ship, a regular caller here, was two days away in American waters. And the suicide here in March of Eritrean refugee claimant Habtom Kebrub, who was found dead hanging from a tree in the Clayton Park area after his claim was denied. Perhaps times have not changed as much as they might. I first introduced the ethics in migration theme six years ago at a national metropolis conference in Montreal where the subtitle was Cruelty and Compassion in Immigration Systems. What are the ethical dilemmas surrounding those points at which a nation's management of its borders through its immigration strategies results in cruelty in individual cases. A year later, we moved that question onto a wider arena at the International Metropolis Conference in, Metro in Toronto, where the topic became ethics and human migration. And we noted that ethical issues suffuse human migration and related immigration practices. Today, I want to be more specific to Canada as we think about ethics and our national vision as reflected in our immigration policy. While there are those on the fringe that argue for open borders for the planet and that no one is illegal, I prefer to start my ethics discussion with the assumption that a nation has the right to control its own borders. Within that limitation, there is lots to talk about. And Halifax has often been at the center. When Halifax sprang instantly and wonderfully to life in 1749, it soon had 2,500 deliberately planted settlers. Six years later, they were on the scene when took place that sordid quasi-genocide known as the expulsion of the Acadians. An interesting point at which to begin a discussion of ethics in migration in Halifax. The new rulers of Acadia had deliberately created refugees. By 1800, there were 12,000 Haligonians. 
most of the increase due to the arrival of 9,000 United Empire loyalists, refugees from the American Revolution. Soon after that, 2,000 black refugees arrived from the War of 1812. Canada and the colonies that preceded it has always been a recipient of refugees. Today we have a narrow definition of what constitutes a refugee. The, the Geneva Convention definition of 1951 that essentially requires one to be what, for ease of reference, I will call a political refugee. This pretty well governs how we look at things today. It was not always thus. The Scottish clearances and the Irish potato famine produced waves of immigrants that built this region and beyond. Deprivation in Iceland, in Polish and Ukrainian Galicia, sent thousands to settle our prairies. The displaced persons who flooded in through Pier 21 in the post-war era were fleeing the devastation of Europe. These were all refugees in a very literal sense, each in their own way and in their own time, although few would have met the Geneva Convention definition. They were welcomed here, and one can infer a shared vision of the building of a nation. Ethical angst around immigration must have been at a minimum. Today we seem contemptuous of the modern equivalent of these folk, as though as not being, they're not real refugees, we say, but they're economic immigrants. There's apparently something wrong with that. I doubt that our ancestors would recognize the snobs we have become. We've already paid a price for this lack of historical perspective, this lack of vision. I'm fond of remembering that back in 1910, when Sir Wilfrid Laurier intoned in his famous speech that the 20th century belongs to Canada, he had in mind a population size of 100 million by the century's end. In 1913, we welcomed 400,000 immigrants to a country of 8 million and we were well on our way. We have never reached that level of immigration since. Two world wars and a Great Depression intervened and Laurier's vision was lost. Of course we have a wonderful country anyway, but compared to what we might have been, we are a minor player on the world stage. Although sometimes I think that with our national arrogance, we like to think otherwise. Laurier, like MacDonald before him, was building a nation. Immigration policy reflected this. Today, we don't talk about nation building. Instead, when it comes to immigration policy, we have a very limited vision. I will call it the limited business model. We've had it for two generations, but it has been accompanied by a streak of outstanding Canadian generosity that has resulted in what I will call the great immigration paradox. In turn, this paradox creates multiple ethical dilemmas. Now, Canada, since VE Day, has welcomed hundreds of thousands of refugees, refugees that meet the Geneva Convention definition. This brings an ethical dimension to our immigration policy that is unparalleled, and that in the aftermath of the boat people wave earned the people of Canada the UNHCR's Nansen Medal in 1986 were the only country, the only the people of any country that ever earned that medal. And at the time, we, we well deserved it. 
However, here is the paradox. On the one hand, we have a long history of accepting refugees and the dispossessed as builders of this country. On the other hand, today we have tight restrictions on who gets in, and we incline to accept only those with superior qualifications, the limited business model. We make a small exception for government-assisted and privately sponsored refugees as a continuing witness to our refugee-accepting role of the past. We grudgingly accept family class arrivals, defined as narrowly as we possibly can. We struggle mightily to confront and discourage and turn back the tide of refugee claimants like Habtom Kebrub that assault our shores in the tens of thousands every year, challenging our generosity and our tribunals and causing most of the immigrant or the immigration related stories that appear in the media. What's happened to us? What's happened to us? One might say that up until the 50s, we emulated the inscription on the Statue of Liberty. Give me your tired, your poor, your huddled masses yearning to breathe free, the wretched refuse of your teeming shore. Send these, the homeless, tempest-tossed to me. I lift my lamp beside the golden door. Today we have the limited business model or as it is described in the Immigration and Refugee Protection Act, the labor market strategy. Can any words, any comparison more aptly describe the shift in our national vision as reflected in our immigration policy? Of course, those glorious words were American, but Laurier seems to have had a similar vision. And how prosaic are the latter, the labor market strategy? So Canadians, that's what immigration is all about in our country today, a labor market strategy. Read it in the act. And thus we have our limited business model in order to do it. Show me one iota of vision in that, one scrap of a nation building policy. People are like tea and coffee. We import just enough of them to keep our engines running. The shift is clearly there, played out between VE Day and the Crosby goal. What's behind it? Is it merely the cautious approach of the good burgers that we've become? Or is it something more sinister, like the racism of the St. Louis incident or faced by Viola Desmond or Louis Armstrong. Play it out in more subtle, modern, politically correct ways. There are still anti-immigration voices, disguised sometimes in the language of reason. And one can wonder as to what is their national vision. Now this introduces us to a number of specific issues that I think pose <coughs> ethical dilemmas. When, when William Shakespeare, he, he, introduced a, he introduced a phrase in Hamlet that's entered the language, getting hoist by one's own petard. That means getting stuck on your own sword. We do it often in immigration policy and practice. Let me suggest some instances. Consider the Haiti dilemma. The Canadian public responded magnificently and generously to the earthquake crisis, and so did our government. There are thousands of refugees from this natural disaster, but they're not political refugees. Letting some into Canada seems therefore not to be an option. Quebec is straining to help around the notion of family ties, but it's not easy when people fit into neither the refugee class, nor the family class, nor the independent immigrant definitions. 
These are all silos, definition silos. Our historic magnanimity and openness to human migration are in sharp contrast to our present barriers. We want to help, but are hoist on our own petard. Is this an ethical issue? Consider another dilemma. We have the largest percentage of foreign-born citizens of any nation, 20%. This is most unusual in a world where, despite all the upheavals, ease of mobility, the global village mentality, only 3% of the planet's population lives outside the borders of the country where they were born. Only 3%. There is therefore a huge demand here, huge, for family reunification, whether it be for permanent settlement or for visits, visitors' visas. Our capacity to respond is restricted by our rules, our suspicions, and by our deliberately inadequate overseas processing capacity. We have allowed the foreign-born to settle here and become a part of the fabric of Canada in huge numbers. And now we can't or we won't respond adequately to their very human cries for family reunification. Once again, our past openness is in contrast to our present barriers. Once again, we have allowed ourselves to be hoist on our own petard. And once again, is this an ethical issue? Consider a related dilemma. I would suggest to you that most human migration is relational. By that I mean there is some type of family tie behind it. For Canada, I would estimate that at least 80% of all the people who immigrate or try to immigrate here are related or connected in some way to someone already here. It's not the wonderful country we have with its democracy and its opportunities that is the main driver behind the clamor to get in. It is a relationship to somebody already here. When 20% are foreign born, this demand is not surprising. Despite this reality that I call the, the elephant in the room, we require people to qualify to get in by fitting one of our few qualification silos, like Cinderella having to fit her foot into the right, into the slipper. Um, when I was a kid in wartime Halifax, there were few sweets. For candy, we ate a tiny breath freshener called Sen Sen. Does anybody else in the room remember that? <laughs> for gum, for gum, we sometimes chewed fresh asphalt. We didn't think about the cancer problems in those days. <laughs> we knew what we wanted, but that's all we could get. It's like that for many would-be immigrants. They want to be here with their family, and they'll take whatever avenue they can get, jumping through the hoops we've contrived. Are we hoisting ourselves yet again when we have a system for managing the growth of our country that is a mismatch for the reality that drives that growth? I'm going to say that again. Are we hoisting ourselves yet again when we have a system for managing the growth of our country that is a mismatch for the reality that drives that growth. There seems to be common sense issues here. Are there ethical ones? We've devised tests to qualify immigrants that emphasize high education levels, high skill sets. We want the best and the brightest. As we cherry-pick the world, ethical issues abound. 
But beyond the obvious ones, and I'm going to leave those to you to think about, what about this? Foreign trained immigrant professionals can't get jobs that match their skills. Not because their credentials are not recognized, although this sometimes happens, but because there are no jobs matching their skills. The registrar for the Professional Engineers of Ontario told me a couple of years ago that he had 8,000 engineers fully qualified to work that couldn't find work in their field. At the same time, there were 30,000 job vacancies in the food services industry in Alberta. I said 30,000. We bemoan the PhD driving cab, but forget that there was a job for a cab driver. This mismatch between what we really need in the way of new labor and what our elitist immigration qualifications test suggests is becoming widely recognized. The chickens are coming home to roost. We are being hoist on our own petard. There are certainly practical issues here. Are there ethical ones? Let me suggest two. We are filling the gap, answering the mismatch, by importing temporary workers in increasing numbers. Last year, there were about as many of these temporary workers as there were new immigrants. I think it might have been the biggest number ever. We let temporary workers supplant permanent ones. Is it ethical to deny the benefits of permanent residency to the temps while benefiting from their labor? At the same time, lack of processing resources and limited annual quotas means that we deny permanent spaces to those who would want them. Is this ethical? Let's look at marriage. We are becoming a country where common law marriages are both common and recognized, and where a significant percentage of marriages end in divorce. At the same time, we have overseas selection officers whose jaundiced or puritanical views of whether a foreign marriage is a valid one or not would embarrass the Pope. <laughs> There are many examples of real hardships and Sophie's choices being imposed on young couples by the arbitrary and not appealable decisions of a single immigration officer. The same thing holds true for refugees rejected overseas after they have been sponsored for their families by the churches of Canada. No appeal from the judgment of a single officer. No appeal. Is this lack of appeal from one autocratic decision an ethical issue? Private sponsors of refugees across Canada are having a bizarre experience these days with one visa post where the applicants, the applications of many Eritrean refugees are being processed. <coughs> Eritrea is a rogue state with a particularly evil government that has not only banned the Pentecostal faith, it has imprisoned and tortured its followers. It also has an army that is essentially a slave army. Once pressured into it, you can't get out. If you desert and get caught, you are jailed and tortured. One trick is to bury a man underground in a steel container and leave him there for months. I know of one man who came out after six months blind. Almost all refugee claims from Eritrea are based on one or both of these grounds. At the particular visa post I mention, one of our interviewing officers is choosing to cross-examine refugees on their in-depth knowledge of the Bible in order to determine whether they are truly Pentecostal Christians or not. She seems often to decide in the negative. Refugees ought to be qualified on the basis of the conditions they fled, not on their biblical knowledge. I think we may have an ethical issue here. 
but there is no appeal. I've chosen thus far to avoid the clearly high-profile piece, the issues surrounding refugee claimants who have landed here and are among us while their claims are processed. There are almost daily stories somewhere in Canada of their travails, usually caused by their rejection and threats of deportation. The field is replete with examples for ethicists to ponder. Habtom Kibrab killed himself rather than face return to Eritrea. This is not an unusual recourse for Eritrean refugees in Libya, another rogue state whose president is apparently a buddy of the president of Eritrea. Libya is home to many Eritrean refugees who, when faced with buddy-to-buddy -buddy deportation back home, are also known to have committed suicide. These things bring to mind the, the Montreal topic I mentioned at the outset. What are the ethical issues when management of our borders results in apparent cruelty in individual cases? Cruelty. As a decent, compassionate people, are we allowing our rules to hoist us on our own petard? Juxtapose the anti-Pentecostal laws of Eritrea with the question of sanctuary of taking rejected refugee claimants into our church basements and defying authority to come and get them. Churches are not always on the side of the law, especially in totalitarian states. On February 9, writing about sanctuary in the Toronto Star, columnist Martin Ridge Cohn argued that Canadian churches have no business acting as though they are above the law, especially when we have a country where the laws are adequate to address refugee issues. This is a very interesting issue for an ethicist. I wrote to the editor. They never publish the things I write, but I wrote to him anyway. So now I get a chance to tell you what I wrote. I find this piece troubling. The laws of any country reflect behavioral and ethical minimums. It is beyond these laws, and perhaps despite them, that one finds things like decency, charity, compassion, manners, morality, good sense, things that cannot be legislated. The act of offering sanctuary enfolds these. To suggest that the state, by entering the field of refugee law, has somehow supplanted these, these virtues, is to invoke a, tal a totalitarian paradigm. I'll let you think about that while I sum up some of these remarks. Uh, a bright young Somali woman was in my office last week. She's a university student and she came here via the government-assisted refugee door. To see and learn about Canada, she traveled across much of it by bus. I wasn't expecting what she said. Do you know what you've got here? She asked rhetorically. I was expecting, perhaps smugly, something to hear about something like our democracy, our freedom, our safety, our opportunity. Not so. You've got space, she said, and no people. <laughs> now that was an interesting perspective. Over the past hundred years since Laurier in 1910, our national vision, as reflected in our immigration policy, has shifted from let them in if not to keep them out, then at least to be careful who you let in, and not too many. This suggests to me a shift from a nation-building immigration strategy to a population maintenance and continued growth strategy. 
and a national vision shift for Canada that I will leave for you to consider and articulate. What do we know about our demography? Our birth rate has fallen to 1.5 live births per female. A population needs a rate of 2.1 to replace itself. The U.S. today has that rate. In some European countries, the rate is even lower. In Italy, it's 1.1. Any country with a birth rate below the replacement rate can calculate the date of its disappearance. Unless there is a dramatic turnaround in attitudes about having babies, or unless there is immigration. I attended a conference of demographers and government officials in Vancouver back in 1997, when our birth rate was 1.7. There it was plainly recognized that Canada needs to bring in 400,000 immigrants a year to compensate for a falling birth rate and the aging baby boom generation. It is only in recent days, the Prime Minister actually mentioned it a month ago, that this reality has begun to enter the Canadian public consciousness. We have a problem. Never mind ethereal issues of national vision. Who will do the work? Now there's a simple solution. Open the doors to relational immigration, which is the elephant in the room anyway. Let families reunite. Stop looking on immigration policy as a labor market strategy. Stop being elitists. Take a longer view, a larger view, a nation-building view. After all, the skills an immigrant brings with him or her soon retire or die. It is the progeny that matter ultimately. It is interesting to speculate as to whether the weaknesses in our current immigration policy might stem from ethical weaknesses. Focusing more strongly on the ethical dimension, holding up our immigration policy against an ethical mirror, refracting it through an ethical prism, might not only give us a more compassionate system, it might give us sensible solutions to practical issues and a boost toward natural greatness. Thank you very much, and I'm looking forward to the conversation. to mention at the beginning that we have a third sponsoring partner for today's event, uh, which is the Canadian Business Ethics Research Network. SACEPA is the Atlantic hub of that national network. And I, we th thought, and Tom has made the point, that it's very relevant that we have a discussion about the pros and cons of equating immigration strategies with labor market strategies. So I wanted to repair that uh, omission. Um, and apologize for doing so. So the floor is open for your questions and comments. Thank you very much. That was excellent. I agreed with everything you said. <laughs> but uh, my question is, one of the other trends in terms of immigration policy has been the devolution of immigration policy to the provinces. And how does that fit with your notions of nation building? I, I think it's one of, the, one of the ironies of the current situation is that the, the, while there may be some, I think there's an abdication at the national level, the ball is being picked up by the provinces. The, uh, you, you, the, uh, the province of Manitoba, and I, I, I know I'm from there now, but, <laughs> but it really is, in terms of the smaller provinces, it is the leading province in initiatives around uh, trying to break through those federal rules. There's a subset of the federal rules called the provincial nominee program. Now it's still within the, the framework of the, the general rules of the, of the federal government, but it gives you some wiggle room. And Elizabeth's nodding her head here. <laughs> uh, it gives you some wiggle room, and, and Manitoba has used it extensively. Um, 
as, and remember, it's a small province. It's not that much larger in population than Nova Scotia. Last year, we brought in over 12,000 immigrants to Manitoba, over 12,000. And at the beginning of the year, the, uh, we'd come to sort of the end of a, of, a, of a cycle where we had that as a goal, to reach 12,000. And the provincial government announced we now have a new goal. We're going to, we're going to go up 1,000 a, a, a year so that whatever number that will be, we will have 20,000. And so and that's every year, not just once in one shot. That's per year. And we're not having any trouble hitting those numbers. We're hitting them because in, in the largest reason is because the province has taken control of its destiny through the provincial nominee program. However, we've also got a huge uh, refugee sponsorship program going there. Manitoba sponsors about it's, Manitoba has 3 to 4 percent of Canada's population and it is bringing in more than 50 percent of Canada's privately sponsored refugees. That's a local initiative. So there are things that can be done. Um, that was sort of part of the theme of the, of the, uh, the work that, that I wrote for the National Committee that Terry mentioned on attracting and retaining immigrants to small centers. But there are things, but isn't it a shame that you have to do it by just using the wiggle room that, does, that is available to you from the federal government. We really need a national rethinking of this policy. We shouldn't have to rely on the, like the special initiatives that Quebec is able to, to, to have because of its special status and confederation. So they're wiggling on their part. Manitoba, which is part of the, main, the rest of Canada mainstream kind of thing, is wiggling too. And now Nova Scotia is starting to do it, right? Yeah. Let me start by saying that I'm a huge fan of more immigration and particularly of the Manitoba model, which is a great success. I probably disagree with you that a national version would work better. I think part of what makes Manitoba work so well is it's so grounded in the communities uh, as opposed to being directed by bureaucrats. Um, but I have two questions for you. Number one is realistically there are millions of people who would like to come to Canada. And we're not going to take millions. Maybe we would take 500,000 or a million a year would be great, but we're not going to take millions. So aren't we inevitably going to have some kind of a filtering process that feels arbitrary to the people who are being dealt with? Secondly, when I talk to the folks in Manitoba who are very proud of what they've accomplished, and so they should be, but they say, look, we do really well with the immigrants. Uh, our success rate in, with refugees is much worse that they have, a, you know, in terms of making those people succeed in their communities. So can you comment on both of those? Uh, well, f first of all, the, um, I can't remember the, the name of the author or the book. I know that I wrote a, uh, a review of the book a couple of years ago. It was published in the, in the Metropolis uh, International mm -hmm. Journal, Jimmy. Um, but the thesis of the book written by a scholar in England was that the idea that the world has its bags packed ready to emigrate to North America, for example, he was thinking of the United States and Canada, is a myth. He says they're not. He said that, uh, and, and I, I tend to agree with him, that, uh, that when you have lots of opportunities to move around the world, and it's only 3% of the world's population that has done so, and largely because of being forced to do it. Uh, I think there is a mythology here that, that we won't be over, overwhelmed necessarily. The thing that is going to fuel our uh, influx is the fact that we've already brought in 20% of our population is foreign born. That's what's going to do it. But I really don't think that the rest of the world is planning to come. I mean, this is a mystery to me. I see pictures on the television, as we all do, of the most god-awful places on earth where people live. They live in Chad, and they live in those desolate parts of Afghanistan. And I think, why does anybody stay there? We haven't studied this. I mean, I, I think we know more about the, the, the migration habits of, of the monarch butterfly than we do about people. Uh, people want to stay home. I mean, even in Nova Scotia. I mean, look. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I'll go beyond Nova Scotia, but 
we have, we have people living all across the north of Canada in what I would call desperate conditions in northern Canada. They have mobility rights in, within Canada. They could all be living in Nova Scotia. They stay there. I, I think that some of our university people should be looking at this human propensity to be rooted, to stay where you are. I mean, there are people like you that have traveled around the world and moved from place to place, and but you're in a minority. On the other question of, I, I don't agree with you about settlement issues in, in Manitoba. Uh, it's not just, first of all, the, the, uh, there's been a lot of research lately on how well are immigrants settling, not just in Manitoba, but M Metropolis has done some research. And there's, there tends to be uh, a conclusion coming up that immigrants are not, generally, are not settling as well today as they did a few years ago. Uh, and in particular, refugee immigrants are not settling as well. In terms of the, the, uh, the kind of indicia that, the, that are easily measured, like incomes, because as, as you are probably aware, since was in 1970, we've been matching all of the arriving immigrants in Canada with their income tax returns later on to see how they're doing. So there are all these Stats Canada data sets that you can study to find out how people are doing. Um, the, I think a lot of those, those assessments are, are simplistic and they don't take into account the, the vagaries of the of the economic cycles within which people come uh, or where they come from because we had a period of time when a lot of our immigrants were coming from Europe and now a lot of them are coming from Africa from a very different background into a very different culture. So this is inevitably going to have, have certain, have certain uh, effects on how well they do. Um, my, my sense of in Manitoba of refugees doing well or not so well, is that if there is a problem with regard to refugees doing not so well, it is with re it's, it's in the government-assisted refugee class as opposed to the privately sponsored. Because the government-assisted refugees come into a community like they do to Halifax, and they don't have the same built-in family networks. They're arriving, they're fresh, they're starting their family here, whereas mm -hmm. The, most of the people who come in under the privately sponsored route have families already in place. Um, and they do much better. So uh, I think we need to look more critically at some of the data that's coming out. One of the things that's been pointed out very recently, and, and the, uh, the current Minister of Immigration has finally got it on his radar too, is that when refugees come in, we saddle them with the repayment of a travel loan. Canadians generally don't know that. And they have to start paying back that loan at three months after they've arrived in the country. And, it's, and some of the, the loans now, and you, the government has been focusing more on bringing in larger families, with oftentimes headed by single moms, because that's the right thing to do. That's the compassionate thing to do. But then they get them here. They've flown a, a big family from Nairobi to Halifax, and now they've got a $10,000 travel loan to repay. And how are they going to do it? But they do. The, the, the travel loan repayments by refugee immigrants are the best, uh, that's the best record of any, of any government loan system in the country. They really do, they struggle to pay back those loans. But if you think about it, you're starting life, you're at the welfare level or at the minimum wage level, and you've got to pay back a $10,000 travel loan, and you're doing it every month. So why would it be a surprise that you're not doing as well in getting established in this country? We give them this huge problem. Now, the minister uh, said he would like to see that loan done away with. Did he say that in Halifax? Yes. He said it, in, he certainly said it in Winnipeg. Um, but... He's got his priorities, and the first priority is to bring in more refugees. So he said, I can't put too much on the plate. Canada's facing a $50 billion deficit this year. He says, we can't put too much on the plate right now. We, he's going to try to spend his 
the money he thinks he can get by bringing in more refugees rather than forgiving the travel loans just now. I think that's a wise thing to do. Sorry, taking too long. I, I'm just finishing up um, a documentary for uh, Ideas on CBC Radio 1 on standardization, and I just interviewed last week um, a British uh, writer and journalist and scholar, a biologist named Matt Ridley. Uh, the reason I wanted to talk to him, the documentary is on standardization, but the question I was asking about is why do we share? So human beings coming together to share innovation, technology, so on and so forth. Uh, and when you were talking, I was thinking a lot about what he was saying because he talked about how population plays a tremendous factor in his research around innovation. And there's more and more documentation coming or studies coming out saying that as populations become isolated or they interact less, the, more, the less innovative they become. And it goes right back to you know, uh, you know, 6,000 years ago. You can see this happening. So my question to you is you're talking about our policies are currently at you know, managing our labor market. How much is the Canadian government thinking about population immigration with regards to innovation? I, I'm not sure that it's thinking about it at all. <laughs> Elizabeth, I think she, she wants to respond here. Conference Board of Canada is now undertaking some research on this very question, looking at uh, immigration and innovation and how the factors relate. And uh, so far, some of the early indicators show that um, that there is a, a relationship between innovation and immigration. And so stay tuned for that, uh, that report. Thank you very much for a really thoughtful presentation. I liked especially the grand sort of schema that you presented, the transition from a nation-building approach to immigration to one that is a limited business model, as you said. Um, when I look at the details, however, two questions come up. Uh, number one, how is the nation-building approach to immigration before the 1950s? How is that reconciled with the multiple race-based exclusions, the Japanese against the East Indians, the Chinese, the Jews, the blacks, and so on and so forth? How, how, do the two, how are the two reconciled? And question number two, if since the 50s, uh, roughly, we have had a transition toward a, the labor market strategy or limited business model to immigration, um, I was wondering how, how can one understand um, earlier cases of, I guess, labor market approaches that I see them throughout, actually, even from the beginning of the century, for example, the most sort of graphic example that I can think of is when Clifford Sifton was talking about the need um, to bring the stout East European peasant with his wife who were going to give birth to hundreds, tens of children <laughs> <laughs> and populate the Canadian West. Was that also a labor market strategy? Only that the labor that was needed at the time was of a different nature. And I could mention other examples along these lines, too. Thank you. Oh, I, I think you're right. And that was then, and this is now. But um, yes, of course, they were. It was, it was a labor market strategy, although it wasn't framed in that, in that fashion. I mean, we were, we were essentially letting everybody in. Um, when we had 400,000 immigrants in 1913, um, we you know, that was a huge number for, that was 5%, equivalent to 5% of the entire population of the country. And I think an awful lot of them went into the prairies. It was a flood of people. And all sorts of exciting things happened. Yes, I don't think that all, all the saints were, were alive then and they're not alive now. Uh, I mean, you've been having these interesting conversations. The, the, the Sunday Herald on the front page had an article about this hairdressing place that was taking its pictures in front of the statue of Lord Cornwallis across the street here. Did you read that? And how they, some aboriginal people took 
great offense to that um, because of the, the, the fact that I didn't realize at the time, until, until I read it in the paper, that Lord Cornwallis, who brought in, set up Halifax, wonderful thing that he did, created this city, was also paying a bounty on the scalps of the Indians. So, I mean, that was then, and this is now, we're having a controversy in, in Manitoba around Nellie McClung, the great female suffragette, the, the one who we, we owe so much to in this country, uh, because they're putting a statue to her on the grounds of the Manitoba legislature to, right now. And there's some objection because apparently she was also in favor of eugenics. Oh, oh. So now we shouldn't have a statue for Nellie McClung because of all the great things she did. There were other, so I think it comes back to, to uh, the, the, a kind of a response to your question that, yeah, that was then and this is now. And although the, the, the result or the effect of what, what was being done in the early parts of the history of this country uh, was much more open, open to accepting people than although there were, there, they, they certainly had their prejudices. And uh, I mean, the Irish were subjected, weren't they, Terry? Subjected to all kinds of, all kinds of uh, prejudice when they came in. Um, yeah, but we were still more open then than we are now, much more controlling. I was thinking as I read, I read the, uh, the piece in the Herald, well, I'm awfully glad that that uh, Lord Cornwallis and his bounty on scalps didn't get my ancestors because I'm a Passamaquoddy. I mightn't be here today if he had had his way entirely. <laughs> okay, well, I'd like to chat briefly, but I guess um, a little bit more in depth about the labor market strategy because what struck me listening to you speak is that Within our own institutions, definitely in my experience and within my own community, you're faced with using market logic for instrumental reasons. So you're put in a position where even if you are feeling the compassion and you do have humanitarian values, we're sort of in a culture where we have to use this neoliberal paradigm just to garner support for those humanitarian causes. And my question always is, is sort of, does the benefit outweigh the cost? You know, if using market logic to determine human value allows us to bring in more refugees or to get a bigger budget for what we want to do, is that good? Or is that sort of a short-term view that's going to leave us perpetuating a culture that's really contrary to humanitarian beliefs? I guess you take what you can get. And you, <laughs> and you, go, with the, you go with the flow. You, you, you play it the best way you can in the t with the times. And, I mean, there are those of us who are, who are part of this, been part of this... Uh, this argument for a long time, who have argued, for example, for more, more refugees. We've been arguing for years to get more refugees into this country uh, without any success until the current minister. Um, and that, that goes back for a long time, Jerry. You know, you know that. So, uh, uh, you, yeah, you, you, have, you, you kind of have to develop a strategy that works with the political climate of the moment. But I think that since the Prime Minister uh, is now talking about the mismatch between the people that we're bringing in and their qualifications and the labor needs of the country, I mean, this is the first time that I can remember a Prime Minister actually facing it and talking about it. So that maybe, I think maybe we're in a shifting moment here where there might be more of an opportunity to begin to look at the larger picture. Because I, th I think that success of governments, I mean, these people are not stupid and they understand the demographics of the country. But I think they've been trying, they, perhaps they have been selling the Canadian public short. I think the Canadian public might be more prepared to grasp the realities of demography and vision than they've been gr given credit for. And I'm hoping that maybe now that we can move it in that direction. We wanted in planning this event to provide the opportunity for a conversation, and we've certainly had that, and I thank you for your thoughtful questions. But to offer a more formal thank you to, to Tom for his excellent presentation, I'd like to call on Dr. Medina van der Plaat, the director of the Metropolis Atlantic Center, to uh, offer some closing remarks. 
Tom, I'd just like to thank you very, very much for accepting our invitation, even at probably the worst time of the year here weather-wise. <laughs> but we didn't lie to you about that. <laughs> anyway, it's been a it was a real, real pleasure to listen to you. I was one of the few, uh, along with a number of other people in this room, uh, who were fortunate enough to listen to your speech in Montreal in 2004, which was the first year, I believe that, well, it was the first year that the Atlantic Metropolis Centre had a formal presence at Metropolis uh, conferences, given before that the federal government had the attitude that we didn't need to look at immigrants because we didn't have any, which was our argument for why we needed a center that looked at uh, immigration. Anyway, Tom, it was just a real pleasure, and as Terry leaned over and whispered when you were finished, uh, no one scolds us as graciously as you do, so thank you very much. <laughs>